You're listening to episode number 82, and today we're talking all about agriculture, bacteria, glyphosate, and more. Welcome to Simple Roots Radio with Alexa Sherm. Alexa believes that simplicity in life is the key to achieving true and lasting health. And now your host, Alexa Sherm. Welcome back to the show. I'm your host, Alexa, and this is the place to get healthy, live happy, and find joy. And today we're digging more into health. In fact, we're going straight to the source of our health, and that is our soil and our food system. Yes, we have guest expert Bethany Davis on to talk more about a topic that I am so fascinated in, and that's glyphosate residue. So we're going to talk about what it's doing to our soil and consequently how this is affecting our health. I mean, we're going to go all the way down to our soil quality, to the health of our plants and therefore animals and even our own body. Like I said, I can't wait to dig into this episode because I myself have so many questions regarding the nutrient quality of our food and why that's changing, including the bacteria in our soil and how that's consequently affecting our gut bacteria and more. I can assure you it's going to be so good. But before we get started, I do want to fill you in a little bit more about a company called Megafood. They are actually the sponsor of today's show and one I'm so excited to tell you more about, mostly because I get asked all the time, what supplements do you recommend and is there a brand that I can trust? Now, I have to be honest, there is a lot of confusion happening in the supplement market today and even from what should I take to what brand should I use? Well, here's one great brand that I recommend wholeheartedly and that is Megafood. Megafood is an innovative supplement company who was one of the first to make whole food supplements designed to deliver essential vitamins and minerals. Their products are verified free of GMOs and they're also, get this, one of the first to be certified glyphosate residue free, which you'll learn how important that is in today's show. Not only do I love mega food because of these things, but because they provide real food supplements that my entire family can enjoy, even my kiddos, and that's really important to me. From multivitamins, probiotics, even immune boosting powders, and that maca I talk often about. If you're looking for a supplement company, mega food is it. I assure you that they have so many products that you're going to love and that you're going to see a huge benefit and value in your own life. You can learn more about their brand and all the products they offer at megafood.com. And like I said, they're extremely transparent, so you can see all of that and the standards they hold themselves to over there. Now, the cool thing about Megafood is that you don't just have to order online. Not that there's anything wrong with getting it shipped right to your door, but for my local friends and friends all over, you can find Megafood products at a lot of grocery stores. So locally, I found them at New Pioneer Co-op and Natural Grocers. But like I said, you can find out all the locations where the Megafood brand is sold by heading on over to their website, megafood.com. Again, you can learn all about their products. You can check them out. You can check out my favorites, the maca powder, the immune boosting powder, and so much more over there. I'll also be linking this up in the show notes in case you don't have a pen to write this down. So again, that's megafood.com or just head to the show notes at simplerootswellness.com slash 082 to learn more. And like I said, today we're going to talk all about the importance of glyphosate residue free certification, how this is impacting our body and why what the megafood brand is up to is so important. You're going to learn more about this as we get into today's show. So let's just head right to the show. Welcome to the show, Bethany. I'm so excited to have you on and talk about a subject that's kind of near and dear to my heart and just get some more facts out there about what we're going to talk about today. But again, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Yeah. So today we're going to talk about glyphosate residue and how it's affecting our health. Now, this is becoming a really big subject, but it's not really in the mainstream media yet. So while it's kind of getting big, I don't know if you would agree with that, kind of behind the scenes, like there's more and more talk about it. Mainstream, it's still a really under-talked about topic. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I would say that uh, the really informed consumer knows. So Mm -hmm. for instance, people who buy mega food products tend to be a highly informed consumer who's kind of paying attention to trends and digging deep. So our our group, you know, the people that, to whom we're regularly having conversations with as a brand, I think the awareness is a little bit higher, but broadly, no. Right. I'd say that for most people, this is kind of cutting edge and new information. Um, and it start, it's more kind of at the beginning of its emergence into mm-hmm. the public um, area of knowledge. Right, right. So let's just back up for a second. And if you have no idea what glyphosate is, we're going to talk about that. So Bethany, can you fill us in on what glyphosate 
is and where we encounter it. Sure. So glyphosate is uh, the active ingredient in an herbicide. And so it's one, it's the number one herbicide that's used in the, our agricultural system in the entirety of the U.S. We use a ton of it annually. Um, and it's not really just an herbicide. It was really first patented as a mineral chelator, and it's also patented as an antibiotic. So that's actually has to do with the function of how the herbicide works. Mm-hmm. But that's essentially what it is. It's a chemical that we spray onto food and soil um, to control for certain factors and certain weeds in in our agricultural system in farming. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay, so when we talk about glyphosate, what is it doing to our health? Like, what is your own personal story and how you got connected with glyphosate and what it's doing to our health? So this is actually a really interesting story, and it's one of the reasons I'm so passionate about the topic. Uh, going back about eight or nine years, um, I was really into CrossFit, which I am now again, but I'll admit that I haven't been consistently mm-hmm. and I missed going to the gym and I went for a run. It was in the summertime up in new England and near Boston. And it was a really dry summer. Um, but I found this beautiful lush park and, um, I decided to do a workout in it. And so I did some push ups and some, uh, lunges in, uh, in this park. And if you've ever had like an itch in your eye yeah. and just kind of like really gone for it, like really just itched your eye. That was kind of what happened in both of my eyes. As my face was going down towards the ground, my eyes became really itchy. And since I had been doing push ups, my hands had been down in the soil, like and on top of the grass. And when I itched my eyes, um, they closed up, they sort of swelled up like softballs almost and, and, and closed up really within less than 60 seconds. Um, I tried to run home. I had to kind of claw my my eye open and run as fast as I could. I was like a mile from my house and I didn't have my cell phone or anything. Um, And so that was pretty scary. And I ran in through our side door and ran straight into the bathroom to try to wash my hands so that I could sort of claw my contacts out of my eyes. Oh gosh. Yeah. Whatever was happening out of my eyes. And my husband, my boyfriend at the time, but my now husband, saw that and thought maybe someone was chasing me. So he actually ran out of the building and down the street looking for what, what I was running away <laughs> from. Um, but it, you know, we, we had to go to the emergency room and my throat started to close and I had a really extreme um, reaction, you know, allergic reaction. Uh, and I went to the town afterwards and asked what chemicals were used in the park. And really they just said, that Roundup was used and nothing mm-hmm. else. So that's when I first became aware that at least on, you know, an N of one on a Bethany level mm-hmm. that I had an extreme sensitivity to glyphosate and it turned, you know, it turns out really to herbicides and pesticides in general. Right. And so I began wondering, okay, wh- why are we just tossing stuff? If I can react like this, why are we just tossing this on our, on our parks. Um, and then I came to find out that, you know, we use it so widely in our food system. It's one of the first things that really got me interested in, um, GMO agriculture, GMO crops, GMO foods, and what that kind of means for the entire farming system and what it really means for soil. Mm -hmm. So I, I ended up on a path where um, a lot of my job has to do with that at this point. Right. (laughs) Right. um, And sort of, yeah. And, and advocating uh, around, you know, uh, people being empowered to really understand it um, and make choices around it. Mm-hmm. Right. And I feel like glyphosate kind of comes in multi different levels. And we live here in the heart of Iowa. And so this, it's such a farm community. And I get stuck in this mm-hmm. battle between like totally respecting what they do and watching these farmers really care for the land the best that they know how, but at the same time being mm-hmm. so dominated by these companies that they're really locked in. Um, and it becomes a really frustrating position to be in. And so we have this whole environmental agriculture aspect, but then we have this whole health aspect. And today I really just want to kind of stay on topic with the health because as consumers, like you said, there there's a, a group of consumers that know so much about glyphosate. And then there's a whole group of consumers that really have no idea that we're constantly eating this in our food system. So can you give us some of the ways in which we consume glyphosate? Sure. So it's typically, uh, it's connected 
typically to GMO crops. Um, that's where a lot of the usage um, is happening. So for corn or soy, there is um, basically seeds that are bred to, you know, withstand applications of glyphosate. So meaning that you can plant corn or soy, spray it with glyphosate, so you're killing all the other weeds, and then you get crops that grow, and the crops won't die, but all the other weeds and, and the life around it will. Mm-hmm. And so it's a way that... Um, that we are simplifying um, some of the uh, process around farming these. And, you know, at first it can really work. What happens over time, and this is still tied to health, is that you're really, it's, the way that it works is it's an, it's an antibiotic. It's literally killing everything else. And actually the soil health, the, the health of the microbiome of the soil mm-hmm. is what makes food nutritious. And it's what allows even from a broader health, like a planet health perspective, it's what allows plants to, to use photosynthesis to draw down carbon from the atmosphere and gra- draw down greenhouse gases from the atmosphere and get them back in the soil where they belong. And so over time, it really erodes soil health, which affects the nutritional value of the food. Um, right. And, and our gut microbiome, the not food. to stop well, you, uh, but yeah, exactly. exactly right. You keep going there's with that. Yeah. Emerging, right. There's new and emerging research, sort, um, research about, well, okay, we're throwing antibiotics all over the food and the soil and then we're eating the food from which it was grown. What does that mean? Mm-hmm. And there is some evidence to believe uh, that to show that it's a problem for us to use antibiotics on our food and eat that food and that it's going to have negative impacts not only on the soil microbiome, but potentially on the gut microbiome um, overusing these antibiotic-based herbicides um, for all the reasons that you can imagine. Right, right. And that, I mean, like you said, This is on nearly everything that's not considered non-GMO. We're going to talk about organic Mm -hmm. and not organic foods later on, but we're consuming it in numerous different ways. And like you said, it's, it's, it's essentially killing our bacteria and in the soil because we get so much of our good bacteria from our soil. So you can start to connect Mm -hmm. the health pieces to this, but can you go into some of the health complications that are being shown in numerous studies all over the world about the implications that glyphosate is having inside the body. Yeah. So there's, uh, when I'm a regulatory professional, so I have a master's in regulatory affairs and health policy. And so when I'm looking at this type of data, I don't do it with the same lens that say like a doctor would. What I'm looking for is what are the best practices and what kind of um, organizations, NGOs, governmental organizations are doing these evaluations and making statements. So when I see the World Health Organization labeling glyphosate as a possible carcinogen, that's something that I pay attention to. When I see the state of California labeling glyphosate as a as a as a possible carcinogen and and requiring labeling as such, that's something that I pay attention to as a regulatory professional. And so seeing these major bodies. Uh, have a lot of questions around around the safety of this ingredient or this in, this uh, chemical and, uh, you know, its impact on human health. That's something that I pay a lot of attention to and I've been sort of tracking for the last several years. Um, so it becomes really important. And the thing is, when you're doing that type of epidemiological, you know, broad research, what you're looking for is how much of this is going to cause a problem. And mm-hmm. it's, it's hard. It's hard to, to know that um, because how much of something in a single exposure could cause a problem in somebody's body versus how much over time. Right. And we were just, we were just talking about how you see this, you know, a lot, you, you know, heavily used and intentionally used and routinely used in GMO agriculture, but it's also used outside of GMOs. So even if you're just, you know, have a diet that's not that very high in corn, corn and soy, um, people use it on all, all types of crops. They use it on, on all types of conventional crops. It's um, often used as a desiccant. So you see it really routinely used in wheat crops, even though they're not GMO wheat, wheat crops, it's just conventional, regular wheat crops. Um, you'll see it used, sprayed all over the crops like a day or so before harvest. And what that does as a desk can, it helps dry out the crop so that it's easier to harvest mm-hmm. and you can harvest it more quickly. Um, and we see that all over. We see that across different herbal ingredients. We see it in, in all different types of fruits and vegetables. 
<clears throat> so it's really being used everywhere. So when you have all these little micro exposures over and over and over again, all the time with all the food that you eat, or if it's used in your home, like people, people have this, they'll spray for weeds on their driveways or in their, in their yards or in their gardens. Or like I said, it can be used in public parks and things like that as well. It's really hard to pinpoint how much exposure people really have. And that's something that mega food pays a lot of attention to and has a big concern around. Right, right. Because it's going to become such an individual approach to, okay, we know, right, it's in our food system, but how much can we handle and how does that build up over time? And everyone's going to respond so differently based on detox pathways and um, hormonal issues that are already going on, you know, like the the exposure load, like we all reach that threshold almost. Um, But Mm -hmm. it's like that twofold approach. And you kind of talked about this earlier with it dealing with the soil. And we know we have to have this great balance of good bacteria to bad bacteria. Um, And once we start killing the bacteria in our bodies, that's also going to decrease the amount of toxic load that our body can handle and break down. So when you talk about the soil aspect of this and what glyphosate's doing to our soil, which then impacts our body in great, great ways, especially our food and the nutrient value. Can you just talk about the connection to poor soil and poor nutrient value a little Mm -hmm. bit more in depth um, than we did in the beginning? Sure, I can. So um, what happened, like how, how soil is connected to nutrition is that soil is like this great connector of our lives. It's sort of the source and destination of all. And, um, Basically, 470 million years ago, Earth was just sort of a rock with ocean. And at some point, a rootless seaweed got stranded in a pool, and it somehow joined forces with a a fungi um, that has this helper bacteria. And it it basically started um, creating a life form from nutrients from the sunlight and the rock. It basically turned the rock into, it it started growing this weed system with this bacterial input. And so, you know, it was this marriage of life forms and that's still what happens. That's still what's happening via the photosynthesis process. That's how soil was created. So roots formed on the plants, the bacteria can solubilize the minerals and kind of breaks down the rock and turns it into soil And the fungi that's also present in soil collects all these plant sugars and delivers them out into this newly forming microbial environment. And that is soil. And that's still happening every moment sunlight strikes a leaf. And so um, that's the exchange that's happening. It has, it's fungal, it's microbial, and that's what's happening in the soil. And that's how we get nutrition. We get nutrition from the food that's grown in that soil. And the nutrition that we need, like that's the nutrition, the essential nutrition that we need to do our daily processes and to keep us out of disease. That's just what we require every day. And that's why we have, that's why the Food and Drug Administration has nutrient guidelines about this is what, this is what you need. These are your daily values. And that, that's how we get them from soil. So broad spectrum antibiotics like glyphosate that actually kill all of that bacteria and destroy that process it's not sustainable. And so what's happening is we've already killed, we've already burned through and destroyed by these types of agriculture, 30 to 70% of our topsoil globally. And the UN predicts that we only have about 60 harvests left. It's different from zone to zone, from country to country. Um, But over over time, 60 years from now, so my five-year-old and three-year-old, by the time they're hopefully ready to retire, we might have burned through the topsoil in such a way that we will not be able to grow food anymore in soil. And so obviously that is alarming. I like food. I want my kids to be able to eat food and that's how we get our nutrition. We can't live without food. And so figuring out how to reverse that, how to actually nurture healthy soil microbiomes, have farming practices that don't necessarily bind farmers' hands, but actually give them uh, an incredible gift, which is, which is soil life and soil health. Um, and that is what is going to propel us forward in such a way that we can actually feed people for, for generations to come on planet Earth. <laughs> and it, it differs from a lot of what you hear from biotech companies um, and advocates of GMO agriculture. Uh, Technically, if you're spraying soil and killing 
uh, all these weeds and with it, the soil microbiome, you don't have to till, which means kind of digging up mm-hmm. your, uh, your land in order to get those weeds out by digging it up. And that actually does release carbon from the soil, which is not great because it goes into the atmosphere. Um, however, what you've also done is sort of halted and stopped the soil's ability to draw down carbon. So you might not be making it as worse as if you were tilling and spraying, Mm -hmm. Um, but you're also completely arresting this natural and intuitive and brilliant process that has evolved on our planet to draw down carbon and get it from the atmosphere back into the soil, which is why we're experiencing all this um, extreme climate uh, incidences because we have too, too many uh, too much carbon in the atmosphere, essentially. We have, it's greenhouse gases. I mean, that's what's floating around up there. It should be in the soil, but we've been releasing it um, by killing our topsoil and releasing it from carbon and doing many other things that we do that puts carbon um, in the air. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, so that's kind of what's happening there and why it's not the best way. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, but it's also, it's so empowering because it's very simple. All we have to do is utilize photosynthesis, which happens automatically, which we require so we can have oxygen to breathe anyways, and do this thing that the soil intuitively knows how to do and just let it do its thing. And that is a huge solution. Um, the solution's right under our feet. And to me, that's very empowering. Mm-hmm. Because people always ask me about supplementation and why do we need it so much now when people survive for thousands of years without it? And my argument is always that our food system is the food that we grow is just not nearly as nutritious as it used to be. But what's your take on supplementation and if we need it? So to me right now, supplementation is absolutely essential. People Mm -hmm. are like, I don't need a multi. I I eat really healthy. And the fact of the matter is that food is five to 40% less nutritious than it was 50 years ago. It's huge. And it has it's to huge. Do with the way that right. we farm. Mm-hmm. And so even just eating the exact same foods that you would have 50 years ago, you're going to get a, a high, a, a much less nutrition from that. You're going to have less nutrition that you're able to unlock. And then on top of that, our uh, the way that we use antibiotics and, uh, you know, basically stress and stress that we have in our lives, all of that is further impairing our uh, our stomach ability to really even absorb these things. And so supplementation is absolutely essential for you to get everything that you need and be able to function optimally now. And everybody's a little bit different, right? So Dr. Taroni Lodog that we work with and helps formulate our products, she wrote a book called Fortify Your Life. And really it goes through, okay, if you're a man, a woman, this age, that age, if you're childbearing age, if you're over 55, here are the different things that you should be thinking about. And, uh, you know, as technology advances, it's easier and easier to find out your nutritional status, but it's absolutely essential. And if you do not get the the vitamins and minerals and micronutrients that you need, you will find yourself eventually in a state of disease. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that's really, that's our reason for being. We're wanting to support people's health, but Megafood actually has a vision for a world that does not have this we call it nutritional poverty and this nutritional crisis. We want everyone getting all the nutrition that they need. And if I think it's, it's best, it's, it's ideal to be able to get it from food. Unfortunately, it's, it's usually physically impossible at this point. And then also we have a lot of questions about people who necess- you know, can't necessarily always afford to eat organic mm-hmm. um, or to eat um, regenerative even, or to grow all their food themselves and know their farmer, you know, there, there's broad swaths of people in this country and in other countries that don't have access and access is a really important issue to us. So we're asking ourselves from a social impact perspective, how can we have a positive impact here? How can, what can we do as a company to make sure people are getting the nutrition that they need um, so that everyone can thrive? Mm -hmm. Um, And that's, that's central essentially to our, to our vision and mission as a company. Right. And it's so true because it's just like this, this, this constant that we see in the health of humans is that not only are we malnourished, essentially? You know, we can be well-fed, but malnourished. And I think that's a really hard concept for people to wrap their minds around is that you could be eating ample foods and still technically be considered malnourished on a nutrient-deficient level. Um, And at the Mm -hmm. same time, our bodies are just becoming more and more inapt to handle toxins. So we just have this, like, our body's just being beaten up in numerous, numerous ways. And 
um, it becomes a scary issue, obviously, that we see it exploding all over with the health crisis that we have. But I want to know, so when you talk about glyphosate, is it impossible to avoid or is it possible to avoid glyphosate? And how would someone do that? Really good question. Um, So it's out there. And something that I think about, you can actually look at like a a map uh, for glyphosate usage. And there's certainly, if you're in a big farming state in a farming community, there's going to be a lot of glyphosate being sprayed, especially during the summer Mm -hmm. and early fall months um, periodically. And so if you do live in a farming community, becoming aware of when that's happening can be really important. Um, If you have a student, like a kid who's a student in a school and there's farming communities surrounding that school, asking those types of questions, it can be really important. Um, Certainly people who are using this in their house without realizing it, (laughs) that can make a big difference. Tell some ways. If you've got little little ones who are outside on the ground playing in your yard and you're spraying outside, that's a great, that's, that's like ground zero, right? Like Mm -hmm. controlling your actual home is and and not spraying the stuff right around that that's a that's an, a really smart place to start and you can ask questions so when you're buying food you can call the companies and ask them what their farming practices are and ask them if they use glyphosate um people are totally empowered to do that and to ask those questions of not only food companies but also supplement companies from whom they buy um the, the brand new thing uh, this is there's a brand new third party certification called glyphosate residue free and so it just was launched earlier in 2017 and it's just starting to get more adoption but it's the only third-party testing standard around herbicides or pesticides and it's focused on glyphosate because it's the number one herbicide used in our country Um, but what this test does what this third-party program does is test the products for our traces of glyphosate, for these little residues that could remain on foods um, when glyphosate's been applied in the agricultural process. And basically it, it ensures that there are no residues of glyphosate in the food. So this is something that Megafood did. Our entire line of products is glyphosate residue free certified. And so looking for that information at the little seal that it's green and it says glyphosate residue free, That's something you can do just about the food you're buying and using your purchase power, you know, voting with your dollar. Uh, That's something that you can do as well. And it gives visibility down to, you know, to the level of actually talking about glyphosate itself. Right, right. And it's nice to know that there is a glyphosate residue free certification, which you can find, but it's pretty rare, I think. Um, Maybe it's just where we live. But uh, when we talk about that, does organic make a difference or is that controversial? Organic, absolutely it absolutely makes a difference. So <clears throat> glyphosate is not allowed for use for organic farmers, which is great. You know, we know that they're not spraying it. I see this really as a farmer advocacy issue because if you're an organic farm or say you're trying to become an organic farm and you're surrounded by conventional or GMO farms where they're spraying tons of glyphosate all the time, uh, you can get contamination. You can mm-hmm. get cross-contamination issues. So to me, the fewer folks that are using glyphosate um, and are using GMO crops, and as people transition away from that, uh, both in a bid to heal their soil, um, uh, but also like if they just want to market edge because they want to become an organic certified farm and they want to get, they want to sell organic products, and that's a value set that they believe in. It's harder to do it if you've got a bunch of con- contamination uh, in in your area. Um, and of course, for the people who are out there spraying it, it, even conventional and GMO farmers who are actively spraying it, uh, it's a health, it's a health issue for them to be interacting with right. all the time. Mm-hmm. So I sort of see it as a farmer advocacy issue and, be, you know, speaking on behalf of our company, we largely buy organic ingredients for our food-based, um, supplements that we make our multivitamins and it's much less likely to find any contamination <clears throat> of glyphosate on organic certified products. We just don't see it as much. It's a much safer bet. Mm -hmm. So organic absolutely helps. It's moving um, agriculture in the right direction. direction. Uh, The only problem is that, you know, less than 1% of of our agricultural land globally is organic certified right now. And so the majority of people are are not necessarily um, having access to food. We, We haven't been able to scale up where we would like to see it so that more and more people can have access to organic 
Right. Uh, Right. And if you can't buy, like, financially, say, financial reasons, right, organic is a lot more expensive, although there's a huge health benefit to doing it. But what do you think about the Dirty Dozen and Clean 15? Do you think that's a pretty good rule of thumb for those people that maybe can't buy everything organic but need to be a little more picky and choosy? Do you like the – do you think it's a pretty good – absolutely is. Yeah, and I've definitely been in different phases of my life where I had to sort of rely on that because affordability of buying 100% organic or even just they don't even have the ingredient organic necessarily all the time at the store that you need. Um, I rely on that. And I I feel like um, my husband jokes that I could be a super taster <laughs> because with my sensitivities, I can actually, you know, take a bite of uh, produce and, and usually let you know if it had been heavily sprayed or not. And what I find is that I can eat organic grapes, I can eat organic cherries, I can eat organic apples, and I can't eat non-organic uh, fruits and vegetables of the same type. And so um, I absolutely believe in uh, using the Dirty Dozen and Clean 15 list. If it's got a really thick, uh, you know, like an avocado or a watermelon, something that's got kind of a thick outer shell or an orange, uh, it's a lot different and the foods are going to be absorbing um, and having less residue right um than something like you know apples and cherries right and, and strawberries and, and i always have really thin skin right and i always think like if you're going to eat the skin like it's probably better to have you know like the thinner like you said the thicker the rind generally you just get rid of it and the less likely it is to actually penetrate the fruit um that's so right. that's kind of a good rule of thumb so yeah that that's really mm-hmm. good to know um and like you said it it really is just we're just seeing it all over our environment I even heard someone talk about how um in the rainwater they can measure glyphosate so um mm-hmm. there's always some cross-contamination which is a whole nother topic that we could get into mm-hmm. um and you could just continue this conversation over and over and over because really we are just now experiencing the implications and there's there's research coming out all the time about cancer patients and they're finding high amounts of glyphosate in their bloodstream and infertility and I mean just crazy, crazy things, right? And maybe, maybe this is just one step in healing our body that we can have power over. And like you said, our dollars matter. You're essentially voting for um how farmers raise food, right? Like we we That's are the right. ones that are controlling it. And it's easy to pass blame on so many people, but each one of us is really in control of what we value the most. And so that's pretty cool. So I just want to get into um, really quickly, mega food. For mega food, something we do is we engage a lot of different third-party standards. So organic standard, the non-GMO project standard, vegan standard. We test for different um, allergens like uh, soy, dairy, and gluten. Um, and now and we also have had a long standing for the last 10 years, general herbicide pesticide testing program, because we're a food-based supplement, a food-based multivitamin. We buy tons of organic produce. This year, I think we'll buy about three quarters of a million pounds of organic produce from farmers in the U.S. and put it into our products and it helps make our products. And so for us, testing for herbicides and pesticides is a really big part of what we do. So we test for over 125 different herbicides and pesticides in addition to glyphosate. That's a great way to, if you're looking for, you know, certain types of values and certain types of quality from a supplement company, to me, it's like whole food supplements, uh, you know, supplements that are made with whole foods. Um, that is the, the cream de la creme to me. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then pr- companies who engage in third, rigorous third-party standards that are in alignment with your other values of quality, uh, that's just a really transparent way for a brand to be able to show what they're offering and what you're buying when you buy their product. And so we do, we do a ton of that. You can see it up and down the side of our bottle. Right, right. And you also have the glyphosate free, residue free certification, um, which, like That's I right. said, you don't see very often, at least not around here. Maybe no, you see it more brand, often. Yeah. No, it's brand new. And you can go to the company that um, administrates that third party standard, it's called the Detox Project. And you can see, uh, I believe, online a list, a public listing of, of companies and products that are certified. And it's small because it's a brand new program. It's the first of its kind. It's the first third-party certification that looks at herbicides or pesticides. And so as it gains traction, my guess is you'll see more and more of it. 
we're kind of an early adopter. We're the only brand to have our entire line certified. And we were one of the first brands to do it, period. So it is new. And so one of the, you know, we're, we're basically wanting to educate people about what it is. I even saw somebody on Twitter the other day um, tagging Megafood. I think, I think Megafood retweeted it and that's how I saw it. But like, someone who saw our bottle, I think was familiar with our company and saw a cap sticker about our glyphosate uh, residue free certification I was like, what's that? And Googled it and was like, oh my goodness, this is something that I should care about and pay attention to. I'm, you know, this is something I'm going to look for more and went ahead and tweeted about it. And so I, I feel like a lot of people are starting to learn about it more. And that's kind of something that Megafood cares a lot about, helping people uh, know what they should be paying attention to and spending some time to do that education and, you know, go out on a limb, I guess. There was no ROI. We couldn't say, oh, we're going to do glyphosate residue free certification and it's, it's going to be this valuable. Um, we couldn't do that. All we could do is say, this is important to our value set. We think this is important to human health. We think this is important to the health of the planet. And so let's talk about it. Let's do this now. Let's talk about it um, and let's uh, help grow this certification and awareness of it. Yeah. Yeah. So cool. Okay. One last question before we go, and then I have a few quick fire questions. But the last question is, what are three tips that you could leave us with to help us avoid glyphosate and maybe just increase our detox pathways? Like just overall health tips on how we can live healthier lives. Cool. Yeah, so ditching chemicals that you don't need from your home is number one. So I'd much rather have weeds and a little bit of, you know, like maybe a not perfect lawn than... Right. Um, dousing the lawn in chemicals that um, may not be very good for us. So that's number one. Um, Number two is getting to know your farmer whenever possible, like buying from people that you know, so you can ask them about their practices um, and have, have some insight into, you know, are they spraying? Are they not? What do they spray? How often is it only a little bit once every five years in a certain corner of their farm? Is it all the time? all day long, several times a year or several, several times a year, all over all of their crops. You can ask those questions. That's hugely empowering to help you make decisions about what types of food you're buying. And of course, the glyphosate residue free seal, looking for that whenever possible, and then supporting brands that uh, are providing those types of products. That would be the top three mm-hmm. things that I think we can do. And then sort of as far as detoxification, um, I know less about that, but from what I understand, our bodies really our kidneys and our liver are responsible for largely detoxifying us from all the things that we're exposed to all the time. And that's a normal body process that's always happening. And so really to support any body process, what you want to do is give your body everything it needs to do what it needs to do. And so to me, Mm -hmm. uh, healthful supplementation with dietary supplements and making sure you're eating a really healthy, well-rounded diet, that's going to give your body the support or at least a piece of the support that right. it needs to do its job every day. Right. Yeah. Provide that right environment. That's that's what it needs more than you doing it for it is just pro- provide the environment. Okay. Yeah, Before exactly. we go, a few quick fire questions just for fun. Um, and then mm-hmm. um, you can let us know where we can find more about you. But the first fu- quick fire question is, what's the first thing you do every morning for your health? Oh, that's a good question. The first thing I do every day is snuggle in bed with my kids. And kiss them and tell them how much I love them and just kind of like get the oxytocin pump in for the day. To me, I do that for my health. I do that for my physical and emotional health. And that's one of the things that starts my day off right, I guess. Yeah. Um, Yeah, that would be my answer. I like that answer. Okay. What's your favorite health book right now? My favorite health book. So I have been investing a lot of time recently in what I'll call uh, books for emotional health. Um, yeah. and so, um, the work of Byron Katie, loving what is, that's probably one of my favorite books right now. I and then also, that one. yeah, so check it out. Um, and also, um, a conscious, the conscious leadership book, it's called the 15 commitments of conscious leadership. Uh, that's an, a book that I've listened to probably quarterly for the last year. And so those two books are sort of foundational to what I'll call my sort of emotional and spiritual health, I guess. I like it. I'll make sure and link all those up in the show notes just in case you're listening. Okay. What is the best piece of advice you've ever received? Best piece of advice I've ever received. 
the best piece of advice I may have ever received would probably be um, when Diana Chapman, who um, is a founder and partner of the Conscious Leadership Group, uh, told me that things don't have to be so hard all the time. Mm. And it's sort of a simple construct, um, but my energy and sort of the way I show up in the world, it's really like, you know, driven with a lot of energy and power. And that's it's my superpower. You know, I'm mm-hmm. persistent and I'm, I have big ideas and I'm passionate and I'm an advocate and I'm an activist. Um, and so sort of balancing my energy and making it kind of big and wide and soft is actually more effective than sort of acting like a battering ram against things. Right. And so finding a way to kind of be in flow and not have things have to feel so hard all the time, that's been sort of a living mantra of mine day to day. Um, and for me personally, it was, it was some of the best advice I've ever received. Yeah. Yeah. So good. Okay. What is the best piece of advice you could leave us with? Oh, um, maybe it's the same thing. <laughs> well, it, yeah, for people out there like me, <laughs> I would just pass on that very same advice. Um, but I guess it's not so much advice as maybe like a, um, a belief system that I have that I would share with anybody, which is just that, um, you know, when you're thinking about your energy and, and what you want to accomplish in the world, um, I think that a lot of our, a lot of our drama and a lot of what slows us down and a lot of what becomes a big energy suck is sort of our own thought processes and, and sort of the stories that we make up about things and Mm -hmm. a lot of the dances we do in our heads and just growing our awareness of that so that we can redirect our energy and our focus. Um, That's something I think is just important for people to think about, especially if they're interested in leadership or activism or advocacy um, like I am, um, and that can be on a you know global scale or, or in your home, but um, and you know with your with your partners and with your kids and things like that. But that that would probably be the thing, just growing your awareness of um, how you're spending your energy and and how how we tend to spin ourselves up, I guess right. basically. And the, the more awareness and acceptance you have of, of yourself doing that, the less time and energy you waste getting spun up about things, and um, the more energy you can put into creating actual real lasting change. Yeah. So good. So good. Okay. Thank you so (laughs) much for all of your wisdom today on this issue. And I hope it's something that we can dive more into here on some boards radio and just learn more about and um, help you make the right changes. But for now, can you tell us where we can learn more about you and mega foods? Sure. So, um, I'm on Twitter and Instagram. Um, most of that, most of Instagram has to do with my kids, but you also see really fun stuff that I do in the industry, like going to Capitol Hill to talk about nutrition um, and lobby for things like, you know, multivitamins being included in the SNAP program and things like that. Um, and on Twitter, you'll see everything from me retweeting funny things that comedians say to um, <laughs> natural products, industry news and things about mega food. Um, so, uh, you can find me in both places. I can give you the links. Um, and, uh, for, as far as Megafood, megafood.com is where you can find out about all things Megafood. Um, and we have a really active YouTube channel and Instagram and Twitter feed and Facebook page. And so we do a ton of Facebook living. Um, we have a really active blog and we do a lot of, uh, fun videos and animation where you can learn a lot more about our company. One interesting link on the megafood.com. Uh, uh, website is to our live cams. So we are big believers in transparency um, to the point where we actually have live cams on our, our manufacturing facilities 24 hours a day. So you can always be uh, seeing what's going down our dryer, what kind of fresh fruits and vegetables we're getting in, what kind of nutrients we're manufacturing, what kind of products are being created, um, and what that all looks like. You can have live access to see how our products are actually made right there. Oh, that's cool. Um, so there's a bunch of cool information available on the website and on our blog. Um, and you can find out about new posts on Facebook largely. Yeah. Well, perfect. I will make sure and link all that up in the show notes again. Bethany, thank you so much for being here and sharing your information with us. Sure thing. My favorite thing is talking about stuff I care about. So anytime. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Oh my gosh, that was one of my favorite episodes. Just so insightful, talking about the soil and the way glyphosate is really just killing the bacteria in the soil 
and how important that soil bacteria actually is. I mean, it's so fascinating, especially when you hear people who say, eat dirt. Well, yes, dirt used to be good. We used to get a lot of nutrition and bacteria from the dirt, but as it turns out, today's dirt just isn't the same, and this is one of the reasons why. So I hope you found that insightful. If you have any questions, please send me an email at alexa at simplerootswellness.com. If I can't answer them, I'll reach out to Bethany, who I'm sure can help out. Like I said, this episode was so insightful. It talked more about the health of the soil, and I really want to get another expert on to take this a little bit further and talk more about what glyphosate is doing inside the body. We touched on it briefly, but more from the fact of how it's how it's working itself up in the food system to us, but I really want to get in depth because there's so much more research out there specifically about that. But just for today's show, I thought that was fantastic in laying the foundation for what is going on and to bring to light some of the issues that are happening with the environment and why our environment is so important to our overall health. Again, if you have any questions, please do not hesitate to email me. Again, that's alexa at simplerootswellness.com. You can also head to the show notes to learn more about today's episode, find more information on Bethany and some more resources to help you get started on this journey of learning more about glyphosate and how you can get rid of it in your own life or at least work to limit it. So again, to find out all the information on today's show, head to the show notes at simplerootswellness.com slash 082. And again, this is one of the reasons I love the mega food brand. It's because they they're one of the first to be glyphosate residue free. And while this is a newer certification, like we mentioned, it's it's not something that a lot of companies are probably going to be able to get just because of how they source their ingredients. Now, that's one thing I love about Mega Food brand is the transparency and just their act of taking a real whole foods and making them into supplements. Because there is a difference between synthetic nutrients and just whole nutrients, right? Our body knows what to do with a whole variety, not as much with the synthetic version. Not to say it can't happen, but your body is more naturally inclined to break down, to digest and absorb the nutrients from the bioavailable or the natural source of those nutrients. And that's one thing that the mega food brand works so hard to achieve. So I hope that you head on over to megafood.com and learn more about their products. In the coming months, I'm going to be showing you some of my favorite mega food products and how I use them in my everyday life, including some smoothies, because there are a few of their products that I, I really, really love. And I've added to my daily routine. And I think you're going to love them as well. Like I said, you can learn more about mega food at megafood.com and find out where their products are sold. If you're locally, like I mentioned at the beginning of the show, you can find them at New Pioneer Co-op or Natural Grocers. And don't forget to head to the show notes to learn more about Bethany and where you can follow along on her own journey. So again, thanks so much for tuning in. Head to the show notes at simperotswellness.com slash 082. And don't forget, while you're there, or just right now, while you have time, to leave a rating and review. And why don't you just hit subscribe? Because hitting subscribe to the podcast helps you to be the first to know when a new episode is released. Even if I don't quite have the show notes done, you get the podcast first. So just head on over to iTunes or wherever you're listening to the podcast, hit subscribe, and then make sure you take a few minutes to leave a rating and review. I mention this all the time. It's literally because this is the lifeblood of the show. It's what makes it go round, and it really helps me to form the show based on what you want. So I would love so much for you to head on over to simperootswellness.com slash review and let me know what you think of today's show and all the shows on Simperoots Radio. Okay, thank you again so much for tuning in. Next week, we have another expert on talking a little bit more about detox. Yes, there is a progression here of talking about glyphosate, what's happening in our environment, and now how can we support our bodies so that we don't have to worry so much about the buildup that's happening inside and maybe lessen our chances of getting a disease. So again, that's coming up next week. We're talking all about the benefits of sauna. And the following week, I have an episode all on detoxing the right way and what you don't know about detoxing that could change everything. So you're going to want to stay tuned. Good episodes are coming up. Make sure you head back, listen to cycle syncing, seed cycling, all of that stuff on hormones. So insightful. And again, I thank you so much for being here. Can't wait to see you next week.